Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next avatar video. So this is going to be the first of probably three or four videos that will act as a recap for uh, the first Yang Chen novel, The Dawn of Yang Chen. So obviously we are only just over a month away from the release of the second Yang Chen book, The Legacy of Yang Chen, which is coming out right in the middle of July. So I think people would like to see a bit of a recap on the first book, because uh, you might not have the time to spend the, what, five, six hours it might take to read the book, or the, what, 11, 12 hours the audiobook takes. So I'm still going to do this as a relatively detailed recap across a couple of videos, but my hope is that uh, this will be detailed without being exceptionally long, and I think that's the best way to always do a recap like this. So. This one here will cover the first 12 chapters of the book and I'll do a similar breakdown for the upcoming videos. This makes it easy for me, easier for me to, in terms of preparation from the, for these videos, splitting it up like this uh, and probably easier to digest as well. So let's just start off with sort of visually because obviously we're dealing with a novel here. We don't have a ton of visuals, but Yang Chen, we know what Yang Chen looks like from ATLA. She's on the cover, as you can see here. Uh, we also, uh, in terms of this specific era of Yang Chen, got to see a little bit of her just prior to the events of this novel in the Rift comic, which is why you can see her there. That event from the Rift is actually referenced within this book, which we will get to. Otherwise, the main art that we have associated with this book is just for Kavik, who is the other main character in the book. This is uh, Yang Chen's basically like avatar companion, basically, as we go throughout this book. So that is what Kavik looks like. Uh, and he is, of course, from the Northern Water Tribe. But we'll get into more details on that as we go forward. The final thing I want to cover just before we jump straight into the recap is so you have a bit of a sense for where we are throughout this book in the world of Avatar. Here is uh, the map of the world of Avatar uh, for locations that are effectively new introduced in the Yang Chen book here and they are the four Shang cities and um, these obviously we've never really heard about before. Taku we technically have heard about before but it's actually revealed in this book that it's a Shang city but this is where they are. So the main one for this book Bin Er is located in the like extreme northern earth kingdom because it's noted as like one of the first uh, earliest locations you can get to in the earth kingdom from the northern water tribe. Um, so it seems to be uh, right up around here because it's also noted as being pretty close to the mountains surrounding the northern air temple, of course. So that's roughly where Bin Ur is. We don't know exactly on the map. Uh, John Dury, which is the other Shang city we go to quite heavily in this book, is noted as being one of the more tail end fire islands. So the tail of the fire nation as we approach the Earth Kingdom is in or around where the uh, Shang city of John Dury is. Uh, again, we don't know which specific fire island it is, but it seems to be somewhere in or around the numbers uh, 7 and 18 uh, on this map give or take. It might be one of the ones just before that, but it is noted as being, you know, not super close to the uh, um, uh, actual mainland of the Fire Nation, and it has a little bit more sort of, you know, culture from other nations included, which makes sense. Uh, the more water tribe focused Shang City is Port Tugak, which of course is down near the south, that it's noted as being on one of the bigger islands down here that, of course, nearby the Southern Air Temple, nearby the Southern Water Tribe, and somewhat close to the uh, Southern Earth Kingdom as well. Then Taku, we of course know from ATLA a little bit. It is located, uh, as you can see there on the image, it's actually in or around like the uh, the edge of kind of Republic City, kind of like where its territory begins to sort of like fade off towards the end, uh, in or around somewhere there as pointed out on screen. But that's just a rough sense for where everything is in um, uh, this book. Otherwise, like we'll be going to like usual places that you kind of would expect where we do get to see some of the air temples, but I think you all know where they are. So, 
For most of the video on screen visually, you will just have uh, this, which is going to just highlight the specific characters who are in focus in this particular part of the book. So you can get a sense for what their names are, the spellings of their names and stuff like that as I go through my recap. So like I said, this one will cover the first 12 chapters of the book. And uh, yeah, let's get into this here. So uh, we start off with uh, chapter one, Voices of the Past. So we are introduced to Yang Chen at eight years old here. And we learn about this interesting gift that she seems to have as the avatar, which is that her connection to the past lives is basically permanently turned on. And at this young age, she has basically no control over this. So effectively what happens to her is she gets completely overtaken by these like visions and um, events from the lives of past avatars and she effectively almost like becomes the avatar during that moment and to everyone on the outside it just looks like she's basically become possessed by someone and um, and this can vary from basically experiencing a past avatars like some of their most intense emotional tragic moments to even just more casual conversations but the nuns of the western air temple which is where yang chen uh, grows up of course manage to figure out what's going on with Yang Chen because they begin to note and document what she's actually saying when these sort of possessions actually happen. And they begin to realize, oh, some of the names that she's talking about are noted figures from history. And they quickly figure out that most of these are the names of like avatar companions. So like best friends of avatars. And so they realize that like, oh, actually by researching this, coming back to her and kind of almost trying to talk to her as if they were this person eases the kind of uh, burden on Yang Chen as she goes through these possessions. And so this is kind of part of how they help her is to just turn these into actual conversations. So um, this is how they calm Yang Chen down. And one of the main people involved in doing this for Yang Chen when she's younger is uh, the character Jetson who is one of the nuns at the uh, temple here who helps to train Yang Chen as well as just helping her through this kind of crazy incidents, of course. So um, in this specific situation where we jump in in chapter one, it is noted that it is uh, an, she's overtaken by uh, Avatar Gun or Gun, whatever way you want to pronounce his name, um, who lost one of his companions, uh, Masosa, uh, while saving the place Ha'an from a tsunami. It has gone down in history as being a failure of Avatar Goon, um, but Jetson does note that, oh well, this is effectively the reason Ha'an is still a place today. It's still on the map because he, you know, succeeded at saving it, but he did lose his companion in the process. Um, and so she kind of just notes that she's kind of witnessed through kind of seeing Yang Chen, the grief and like these moments of past avatars but she kind of wonders how does Yang Chen herself deal with the fact that she directly experiences these kind of pained moments for past avatars and um, basically daily and so the uh, the chapter ends with just the nuns kind of wondering like what how are we going to handle this going forward we then jump into chapter two which is three years later. So Yang Chen is now 11 years old. And at this point, she has fully figured out that she is the Avatar. They knew she was always going to figure it out because she's just referencing all this Avatar history. Um, so what's going to happen in this chapter is that Yang Chen is going to make her first attempt to meditate into the spirit world with Jetson as her guide. Um, the two of them have become very close at this point. Um, and it's noted that, you know, in most cases, you know, they are their sisters and um, it's kind of like a big family at the air, air temples, but they are exceptionally close. And um, so Yang Chen still has these past life visions, uh, but it doesn't seem to be as bad as they've found ways to sort of uh, mitigate it. But it is still, of course, a, a bit of a problem here. So Yang Chen kind of worries throughout this that... Um, because her kind of connection with the avatars is kind of broken in a bit of a weird way, she kind of wonders, is she going to be like a failure of an avatar? So she's putting a lot of pressure on herself to make sure that she can actually succeed at this uh, transition into the spirit world. And with the guidance of Jetson, 
she manages to do it with E's first time. So it's a major success for a young Yang Chen who has experienced a lot of kind of bad things, I suppose, in her early life. Uh, and this gives her a lot of confidence that like, oh, I, I might actually succeed at being the Avatar. This is good. And so Jetson and Yang Chen go to explore the spirit world. Things are happy and great for now, but we will return to this at a later point. So then we skip ahead to chapter three, which is basically a further six years later. Yang Chen uh, in general is like 17 over the course of this book. But we start off chapter three in the Shang city of Bin Er with an errand runner named Kavik, um, who has a mission to steal information from a specific room in a guest house called the Blue Manse. So on the way there, he does note a large gathering of people and a lot of tension in the air with the people of Bin Ur. A riot is definitely on the verge of breaking out. The people are angry with Shang Tian, um, for paying, uh, for not paying the people money that he owes them. We'll get the details on this a little later on. Um, so the people have cornered him uh, to make their demands known. Kavik is walking past this because of course he has a mission to go to um, as Tien emerges. Uh, but he has a lot of muscle with him who he immediately sends to basically attack the crowd. So he gets away with doing whatever he did scot-free here as he just attacks the people of the place that he is one of the kind of leaders of. Kavik then arrives at the Blue Manse, which is actually revealed to be a house made entirely of ice. So he is going to have to use his water bending to infiltrate. He does note, interestingly, that... Um, while he is a solid waterbender, he is nothing compared to the talent that his brother uh, has at waterbending. He even calls himself Kavik the Lesser and his brother Kalyan the Great. So what he needs to do here is basically waterbending, like kind of phase himself into one of the support pillars of the Blue Mans and then use waterbending and kind of climbing skills to... Uh, go up directly through the ice pillar uh, to make it to the top floor and get to the room that he actually has to go through. So it's a tough maneuver here because there's some delicate water bending involved. And um, plus the clock is going to be ticking on this mission because even though he's a water bender, he is, he's not immune to the cold here. He's still going to be touching in or around ice for a long period of time as he makes his way up. So frostbite is a danger here. So uh, he reaches the required floor. He has to wait a long time as like guards move past. So he has an easy path into um, his location, of course. Um, eventually, he has to make a bit of a risky move and uh, like not wait as long as he probably would have wanted to. But he does manage to make it into the room without particularly badly injuring his hands. Um, so... Um, he makes it to his destination. So he searches around for the information that he's looking for when all of a sudden an air nomad girl around his age enters the room, catching him in the act of like looking around, stealing. And um, he gradually begins to piece things together as he gets a kind of better look at her and kind of thinks like, wait, there's only one reason an air nomad would be staying in a relatively fancy guest house like this in a different nation. This is the Avatar. And <laughs> right as he figures this out, um, Avatar Yang Chen, of course, uh, lets out an airbending assisted scream, alerting all the guards in the location to the fact that there is an intruder. So this is where we cut the chapter and we go into chapter four. So Kavik moves to escape by water bending through the floor. Um, so this is what you can do in a, in a house made entirely of ice. But he seems to just be barely stopped from escaping at a, few, a couple of times here. It doesn't appear to be the guards doing it, um, but what's going on here? He manages to fight pretty well against the guards with some clever water bending and also uh, just wrestling hand to hand, um, which is actually his strength over his bending. Um, but he is eventually captured. Yang Chen eventually appears and orders that the guards not hurt Kavik because she wants to speak with him 
in a couple of minutes. Um, so obviously the reveal here is that, uh, yes, it was Yang Chen casually, almost like off screen, just barely stopping him from getting away with some clever earth bend, uh, some clever bending herself. Then we move into chapter five. So the guards have just ignored Yang Chen's order and begin to beat Kavik. When she returns, she immediately fires all of the guards for just blatantly ignoring her order. She uses uh, her water bending to heal his wounds and his nearly frostbitten hands from earlier on. They then talk. So she learns that he is an independent errand runner in that like, he doesn't work for the Shangs. Um, so he's just on his own. Um, and that this has confirmed some of what she's heard about Bin Ur, is that like it's a city of spies where everyone has someone working for them to get information for them, and that's exactly the way it is. She asks for what like his story is, what, why has he ended up as an errand runner? And he, he explains to her that he's on his own, he has no family, he's just trying to survive by doing this errand running kind of like odd jobs situation. So she decides... I can help here, I don't want to spend too much time dealing with this guy, but if he is just doing this for the money, I'll give him some of the money that I have, because I get a huge uh, kind of diplomatic expense budget, I'll give him some of this money, that will keep him off the streets for a certain amount of time, and that should overall help things. So she just gives Kavik most of the money that she has, and uh, is willing to just completely let him go. He's stunned, of course, by this, because... How has he managed to get away with everything that's just happened and with a ton of money as well? So he leaves. Uh, Yang Chen says, you know, go that way and you won't be caught. And he's gotten away with it. He doesn't have the information, of course, um, but he, he seems to have gotten away with it. Um, so on his way home, he stops by uh, Mama Ayunarak's kitchen and he gives her all of the money that he just received because he wants to help her where she runs a food kitchen that uh, gives uh, food for free to people who uh, can't find work. So he's helping out um, Ayunarak here to run her kitchen. But also, he wants her to kind of take a break as well, uh, to go to Port Tugak to visit her cousins also. Um, after this, he then goes home, and in a bit of a twist, is greeted by his parents, revealing that he has actually lied to Yang Chen about having... A family. This brings us into chapter six. So uh, his parents ask him where he has been. He lies to them, of course, because uh, he wants to make out that he still just has this normal job, but actually he's an errand runner. But his parents have actually been asking around a little bit, and so they know it's a lie that he doesn't have the normal job, and they mostly know what he has been doing, that he is an errand runner. They want to know who he's working for, but also warn him that this path is not good. You know where this will go. Referencing the fact that, where's Kalyan? And it's revealed here that he has somehow disappeared. They don't know where he is. And that Kavik is actually doing all of this errand running to sort of follow in his brother's footsteps to find out where his brother has gone, what happened to his brother. But his parents don't want to lose another son for, for all this errand running. But the family talk is interrupted by a sudden knock at the door. Uh, Kavik's mother goes to the door and is stunned by who she sees at the door. It's Avatar Yang Chen, of course. Into chapter 7. So Kavik's parents rush to prepare the house for a VIP guest. As Yang Chen makes it known to Kavik that uh, she knows about the, the lies uh, because she's found uh, her way to his house and has met his parents here. So she talks to his parents about uh, their situation and in general the situation in Bin Ur. How did they come to live here? So they're originally from the Northern Water Tribe and they moved to Bin Ur after some bad hunting and fishing seasons. Uh, they've been in Bin Ur for the last five years and they do wish that they could return to the Water Tribe and for a long time they've wished this. Um, but because of how strict things are in Bin Ur and the way things are run by the Shang merchants, um, it is incredibly difficult to get an exit pass to leave the place once you've got in there. 
Um, and also there is a lot of corruption going on here, which makes it even worse. Um, and this is part of why there are such high tensions surrounding stuff like the incident that Kavik passed by earlier on. But Yang Chen does get to her point here, which is that she is actually here to speak to Kavik. And she kind of creates a little bit of a lie herself, saying that Kavik helped her out earlier on by like preventing a theft, which forces Kavik to lie a little bit more about what exactly went on earlier on. But then Yang Chen and Kavik do get to talking uh, by themselves. She is annoyed about the lies, but also impressed that she believed lies from someone. That, that doesn't typically happen with her. So she's impressed enough that she's made the decision to effectively hire Kavik to be her errand runner. That uh, the whole city is known for like someone is in someone else's pocket. Well, she wants Kavik in her pocket. And um, so this is an interesting turn of events, of course. And Kavik just sort of notes that like, why is this happening to me? Um, what does Yang Chen keep getting in my way almost? Um, because of course, Kavik has his own goal. He wants to do what he's doing to try and get his brother back, but he doesn't want to reveal to like Yang Chen that that's part of his goals. But we move into chapter eight. So Yang Chen explains that because she is basically the most recognizable person in the world, she can't really gather information secretly herself. And so someone like Kavik, who is very low key, is invaluable to her in her attempts to be as effective an avatar as possible. Kavik wants no part of this since he has the goal to uh, get his brother back, but Yang Chen forces his hand by going out and announcing to his parents that she has offered him the chance to be an avatar companion. They are delighted and this forces Kavik's hand. He has no choice but to basically agree to work for Yang Chen here, even though Publicly, what they've said to his parents is a little bit different than the reality of their situation, but we'll see. It kind of will develop from being more of a business thing into like, actually, Kavik might make a really good avatar companion. But then we go into chapter nine. So the next morning, Yang Chen wakes up and she checks to make sure that she is still herself and that it's not immediately waking up as a vision of a different avatar. So over the years, she has used various mental exercises to limit the impact of these past avatar visions. She focuses in on her own memories, the events from yesterday, meeting Kavik, how they link into her plans for today. And this focuses her mind on I am Yang Chen and away from the I could potentially be one of the other avatars. And uh, this keeps her back on track. So she's preparing for a meeting with the Shang merchants that is scheduled to happen uh, later on because of course she is here to try and make some change happen in Bin Ur with all of this uh, bad stuff happening as we've recently heard about. Um, so she's meeting with the Shang merchants as well as the Zongdu, the leader of Bin Ur. She notes that the item Kavik was about to steal is important ahead of this meeting. It is the original architectural plans of Bin Ur and specifically the meeting hall they'll be having the meeting in, and that it shows that the, the hall originally had heated floors uh, underneath, and she's going to use them to her advantage right at the end of uh, the content we'll cover in this video. So uh, she and her advisor, Boma, ride on her bison, Nujian, to meet with the Shangs. They walk there in a parade through the streets. It's a big event because the Avatar is here um, and people are excited to see her, but not everyone. And she also notes the efforts made by the high ups to hide a lot of the worst parts of the city, to make it look better than it actually is, hiding away the problems that she's actually here to try and solve. Suddenly fruit is thrown at them from the streets. Yang Chen blocks the ones aimed at her, but Boma does get hit, which enrages Yang Chen. And um, she is trying to help them, and this is what they respond with. But she kind of calms down a little bit and realizes that this is understandable to a certain degree. They see effectively a famous person waltzing through the streets here. She hasn't helped them yet. While she is frustrated that they've done this, she gets that kind of difference of like, she has a higher status than them until she helps. This is the only way they'll ever see her. But it highlights to Yang Chen, she is going to have to make something happen at this meeting, like 
at all costs. She is not the type of character to just be like, guess I can't do anything. So then we go to chapter 10. So Yang Chen and Boma arrive at the meeting hall. Boma is immediately annoyed by the lack of respect shown to the Avatar by the Shang merchants. Uh, most of them refuse to even stand up when she enters the room and even like address her. But Yang Chen calms the whole situation down. She wants to keep things kind of uh, peaceful and focused for now and not insult anyone. So she meets the leader of Bin Er, Zongdu uh, Hansha, um, who begins to explain to her the history of the Shang cities. She already knows this, but politely listens to not insult um, the people meeting with her. So at this point, we have a bit of a sidebar here. The chapter goes through this and we will go through it as well. And that is basically the history of how the Shang cities came to be. And basically the history of one of the most important events of the Yang Chen era, the Platinum Affair. So eight years ago, Earth King uh, Feishan came into conflict with rebel forces in the Earth Kingdom led by General Nong. Uh, while all-out open war never quite happened as it's described that like the two factions sort of like danced around each other, never quite wanting to actually go into combat with each other. There was huge tensions at the time here, a true rebellion in the Earth Kingdom. And um, the Fire Nation and Water Tribes both, of course, wanted to benefit from this conflict within the largest nation in the world. So they secretly threw their support behind General Nong, uh, expecting him to maybe be the victor, benefit from maybe a change of leadership in um, the Earth Kingdom that like they helped to make happen, of course. So a lot of politi political stuff going on here. Um, so what they do here is that to make it not come across immediately like they're just blatantly supporting one side over the other, they give very minimal support to the Earth King. They send paper banknotes to help support his campaign versus they send whole shipments of platinum to General Nong to support his campaign. So obviously one is much better than the other. One's just like a chunk of paper that doesn't feel super real, whereas the other is one of the most valuable substances in the entire world. Um, so they've given way more support to the rebel factions here. But they have underestimated Earth King Feishan, who, despite being exceptionally young at the time, only 20 years old during the event, um, he has been underestimated, and in a sudden move, he strikes. A an actual conflict happens in this conflict, and he strikes against the rebels, an actual battle happens at a place called Lamapaka's Crossing, and this effectively brings this conflict to an end in one instance. They completely wipe the rebels out in this moment, and it's revealed that Feishan knew what the Fire Lord and the Water Tribe Chief had done in supporting one side over the other, and so decides to stop all communication with the other nations, stop all trade with those nations as well, and he even melts down the platinum that he got and makes it into a badger mole statue that he places behind his throne, stating effectively that trade and communication will not begin again with the other nations until this amazing platinum statue fully tarnishes, which will take a hundred years basically. And um, so this is a huge international incident here. The only thing the Fire uh, Nation and Water Tribes can do is basically do the same thing, also stop trade with the Fire Nation and each other. So it creates this big um, stalemate situation here where no one's communicating or trading with each other. The air nomads are the only ones capable of still kind of moving around effectively during this era because they're not really involved in it as such. But yeah, world trade has effectively stopped. Um, but all of the nations would still like to have the goods that are produced by the other nations because they've gotten used to having trade with each other. And um, so something has to be done here. So a reluctant agreement is made between the three main nations that four cities be created, uh, led by trusted merchants, and that only through these cities will international trade be done. Each city will have a leader called a Zongdu, and that leader will only stay in charge for a couple of years before being replaced. This is effectively so as to not truly turn these 
important positions into like world leadership positions, which becomes a bit of a plot point, as we'll see. So this is the state of uh, current international affairs. The main three nations in the world all have next to no relationship with each other, and only the air nomads are really free to travel between the nations as they did before the Platinum Affair. And, of course, this means that Earth King Faishan has a huge legend behind him as a leader now because he came out on top in this wild situation here. So this is where the Shang cities came from. It's why these people have power and so much power, despite not being true uh, leaders overall. But now we cut back to the meeting. So after the lesson, Yang Chen notes that, okay, cool, there are positives to this system, but no system is perfect. She wants to get straight down to business and move to make changes that will improve things in Bin Er for the people. But the Shangs are kind of very uncomfortable with this idea. They don't want to change anything because they're very happy with how things are going. They're making their money. It's all working out well. And they just seem to refuse any move from Yang Chen to make any change. Uh, she does even note that uh, Shang Tian, uh, from before, basically sparked a riot by refusing to pay workers just because he happened to later cancel a construction project that a lot of work was already done on, that that is not a fair thing to do, um, that he caused that incident and that they need to address things like that. Um, but they just continue to note how difficult any change would be while Yang Chen tries to keep things focused on, we need to make a change. She's like, we can write up these changes together. I will do basically all of the work. I can implement ideas that were very successful in Omashu and why Omashu is so successful in this era. Um, but they just seem absolutely unwilling to even try. Uh, one of the Shangs named uh, Nohai uh, gets to uh, the point of the Shang merchants and is like, hey, if this was a spiritual matter, maybe we'd listen to you. But she notes how even skeptical she is over recent uh, spiritual issues like the events in Tian Hai Shi. Um, but in this specific situation, they don't have to listen to her. She may be the avatar, but she has no authority over the Shang merchants. They don't have to listen to her. And that's where this chapter ends with just seemingly the dismissal of Yang Chen by the Shang merchants. We then go into chapter 11. So Yang Chen is completely taken aback by their attitude to this whole situation. She tries to argue that like, you know, do you not care about the people? Basically, she's stunned by how little they seem to care about the people that they actually rule over. Uh, they note that uh, once the Earth King gets his share of the revenue that they deal with, they can continue as is. They don't need to change anything. So a frustrated Yang Chen sees no other choice than to go for basically the nuclear option in this situation. She notes out loud to everyone in the room that King Feishan does not appreciate being cheated and that treason is something he cares about deeply. So the tone of the meaning immediately shifts upon her, invoking the name of the Earth King and mentioning that they have cheated him. So they're immediately really fearful of this because of course they've done something wrong here. But what is it? She explains that she's done research ahead of time. She knows that they are letting way more trade, way more ships than is actually allowed by the rules of the Platinum Affair through. And that she doesn't believe that the Earth King is seeing any of this extra profit. So how do we resolve this? And she effectively says, I will let this slip. I won't tell the Earth King about what you're doing. I'll let you continue to do it. If some of this extra revenue is redirected back into the city to the people, you will be allowed to continue to do what you do. It, it's a, it's a, um, it's a more kind of like illegal kind of, uh, kind of deal that Yang Chen is coming up with here, but it's, it's certainly a way to help the people that is a little bit more in line with maybe the way the Shang merchants seem to do things. They are forced to reluctantly agree, but they really, really don't like the way the meeting has turned. We then go into chapter 12. 
So the rest of the meeting just basically passes by, nothing of note happening. Yang Chen dropping the bomb of the, the referencing the Earth King has just completely turned things around. She thinks like she probably went too far in mentioning him so strongly, but um, it had to be done. Hansha talks to Yang Chen about this. He he wishes she had like just said this to him privately beforehand. But she doesn't regret at all what she did. This had to happen here because, in her mind, the Shangs have gotten way too comfortable with, as she says, basically manipulating both kings and common people, um, and that something needs to change here. And Hansha knows that he has a problem to deal with now. So this is where they part ways. But Yang Chen knows that, okay, it's one thing that they like agreed with me during the meeting, it's another thing actually having that actually happen. They're going to have a conversation with each other about what just happened and probably find some way to squirm their way out of this situation. So what she does afterwards is she basically gets Boma to help her sort of slip away so that no one knows where she is. She goes into the, the kind of back streets and eventually finds her way into the maintenance tunnel for the meeting hall and then slips into the old unused heating system that she knew about from earlier on. Um, interestingly, at this point, she begins to have a bit of a panic attack and realizes that it's not any particular fear that she has, but actually that a avatar in the past, one of their fears of enclosed spaces, confined spaces, is kind of beginning to come through as part of her kind of gift, her connection to the past lives. But she uses her mental exercises again, focusing on her own memories and composes herself. She makes her way through the heating system to the parts of the heating system that are underneath the room where the Shangs are going to have their discussion. And so she readies herself to listen in on their private conversation about the meeting that has just come to an end. And the big thing here as we end the first part of the recap is that she is about to kind of listen to what these merchants are going to talk about when they feel no one of uh, note is listening. So what truths are going to be revealed here? Because Yang Chen is just here to help things in Bin Er. She doesn't particularly know of any greater conspiracies going on, but this will be the point where the book really kicks into gear and we get the the big threat in a way that we need to deal with here. So that is recap part one. I look forward to the second part of the recap for the middle kind of uh, third of the book uh, coming at some point in the future. My plan is to not have too much time between these, but also, you know, so the expectation probably is like one a week type thing. But um, that has been part one of the Dawn of Yang Chen recap. In the comments, let me know if you have any questions or thoughts, potentially improvements on how I can do these videos going forward. But uh, that has been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.